This Week in Law is up next. I'm Denise Howell, and joining me today are Baron Soka, Trevor Tim, and John Bergmeier. We're going to talk about IE10 with its built-in Do Not Track, the advertising industry in general. We're going to talk about Dish's Hopper, Google versus Oracle, and Google's Big Win. Lots more next on This Week in Law. Netcasts you love. From people you trust. This is Twit. And with for This Week in Law is provided by Cashfly at C A C H E F L Y dot com. This is Twill, This Week in Law with Denise Howell, episode 164, recorded June 1, 2012. The right to bear fast forwarding. Enhance your workflow, send files of almost any size easily and securely with ShareFile by Citrix. Try ShareFile today. For a 30-day free trial plus double storage, go to ShareFile.com, click the radio microphone, and enter promo code TWILL. Hi, folks. It's Denise Howell, and you've tuned in for This Week in Law. If you love tech law and policy the way we do, that's why we do this show, you're going to really enjoy the next hour and a half or so of our discussion, I trust, because we've got an amazing panel of folks, great experts on various fields of technology law and policy joining us today from some very well-respected organizations. Uh, number one, we've got Baron Soka joining us from Tech Freedom. Hello, Baron. Hi. It's great to see you. Thanks so much for joining us. Sure. Uh, also with us today is John Bergmeier from Public Knowledge. Hi, John. Welcome back. Hi, Denise. Thanks for having me. It's a pleasure. And hopefully joining us shortly is going to be Trevor Tim from EFF. We've had a bit of a Skype issue, and he had a bit of a computer issue, so we're hoping to add him in uh, very shortly, have him join in our discussion as well. Uh, let's start off. We've got a ton of great stuff to talk about this week. Lots of good developments. I promise we're going to get into okay, about the uh, victory. Oop, that sounds like it might be Trevor. Maybe? Nope, maybe not. Uh, we'll get him on briefly, I hope. Anyway, uh, we're definitely going to get to the victory uh, by Google in its case uh, with Oracle where Judge Alsop talked about the copyrightability of APIs and decided that in this case, that wasn't going to happen. Uh, but right now, what I want to start off with is something that came down just yesterday, a decision by Microsoft to go ahead and in IE10, uh, and that means in Windows 8, its forthcoming new operating system, do not track is going to be on by default. Now, this obviously is a, um, a move to cater to folks' concern about privacy considerations and a way to play to the market and say, hey, you know, we're out there, one of these competitive browsers. Uh, Microsoft has lost a lot of its market share in the last several years to the point where it's, for all intents and purposes, pretty neck and neck with Chrome and Firefox. I think it's a bit out ahead. Uh, but to distinguish itself yet further, it is uh, going to come out and have do not track on by default. But this has ruffled a number of folks' feathers. Certainly the advertising industry is not real excited about it. And the WC3 has had a work group uh, addressing the do not track issues um, that has been hoping to work towards standards and consensus as to this sort of thing, Microsoft has perhaps sidestepped that a bit. Baron, I know you have some thoughts on this. Why don't you bring us further up to speed? Yeah, sure. So I'm working on a piece about this right now. I've been engaged in this subject for a long time. And um, the gist of the piece is that I think the, the natural impulse is for people to think that this is really good news for privacy. But I, I would really encourage uh, privacy advocates to think twice before jumping to conclusions here. So the, the problem in essence, is that right now, do not track, uh, which is an option in uh, in Firefox and, and will be, as you said, turned on by default in um, Internet Explorer 10, which is going to roll out on Monday. Uh, it doesn't actually mean anything. Uh, in other words, it's a header that says, don't track me, but with, with very few exceptions like Twitter, which has agreed to implement that, uh, it's not yet clear what that actually means. So today, uh, I, I think it's fair to say that sending out that header is essentially, as the old saying goes, it's like a fart in the wind. It just disappears. It doesn't 
meet anything. And, and if you wanted to meet something, if you, if you care about that, as I think uh, people who are concerned about privacy do, what you need is a workable definition. And so the, the central problem here is that Microsoft, for whatever reason that it did this, has, um, has really derailed the W3C working group that was working on a definition of that header. So bottom line, if you want do not track, this is actually pretty bad news. Uh, it makes it very difficult to see how that process is going to come to some workable definition because it started last November with a very, very explicit statement that this sort of automatic uh, default setting would not be, um, would not be acceptable. And I, I think it's worth just quoting one sentence here, if you'll indulge me, which is that uh, the goal uh, was to allow a user to express their personal preferences regarding cross-site tracking Key to that notion of expression is that it must reflect the user's preference, not the preference of some institutional or network-imposed mechanism outside the user's control. So bottom line, immediate impact. Uh, the, the W3C working group, which I'm participating in, was supposed to meet at Microsoft's campus in three weeks. And that meeting is probably going to be moved. The other people in industry that have participated in that process are, I think, pretty understandably upset. And it's, it's hard to see how that working group is going to proceed now that Microsoft has, again, for whatever reason, decided to, uh, to change that basic premise. And, and I would just add one more important detail to this, which is that um, industry has already actually agreed to respect the do not track header in principle. They cut a deal through the Digital Advertising Alliance, which represents about 90% of the ad networks and other ad players in the industry in the U.S. Uh, cut a deal with the White House and the FTC in February, agreeing to respect Do Not Track, but again, on the condition that uh, the user has affirmatively chosen to exercise a, a choice in a browser-based tool. And that's why the Digital Advertising Alliance was um, pretty angry yesterday in their statement, insisting that default settings that automatically make choices for consumers uh, don't actually increase transparency or consumer choice. And, uh, and finally, I would just say in terms of setting the table here before we talk about what's going to happen next, that it's worth noting that just before we got on this show, uh, Firefox, which has about a 20, 22 percent market share as compared to Internet Explorer's roughly 50 percent market share, uh, has come out and said that they would respect the commitment that they made to user choice when they began the W3C working process. And so they're not going to turn this on by default. So the question now is, uh, what's going to happen? And I, can, I can help game that out a little bit, but let me stop there before we move on. Sure. Uh, or thanks I can for continue that. talking. <laughs> well, we'll definitely come back to you. Um, let's. I, I actually wanted to try and pin down one issue, not that it matters too much for the purposes of this discussion, but um, I was interested in, you know, who's on first as far as the market share game goes and was trying to look that up for the show. Um, and it seems to me the W3C has Microsoft Internet Explorer at less than 30% as of April this year, 28.9%, with uh, Firefox the next at 24.1, Chrome at, tw or I'm sorry, Chrome the next at 25.9, Firefox at 24.1. So it just, it, it seems to me like, like the competition here is, is much more stringent than it used to be. And that, you know, in my own mind, that was... Um, a potential reason for Microsoft to to take this step. Now, the other thing that, um, you know, my first reaction to this was, well, you know, it's a bit paternalistic. Are, are we really all so unsophisticated that we can't be presented with a choice when first firing up a browser, you know, if we want do not track on or off and what it means to have it on or off? And gee, could there possibly be some ways to fine tune that too? Um, so to make a blanket decision one way or the other, I agree with you, Baron, is, is not real um, productive as far as implementing the actual desires of the users. I think uh, Trevor has joined us now. Hello, Trevor. Welcome to the show. Hi, thanks for having me. Sorry about that. A little technical difficulties. Uh, no problem. Uh, glad you could join us. Have you uh, been listening along and do you have any thoughts on this uh, micro Microsoft move? I have. Um, I guess the only thing that I would add is that they also said that they, you know, there's, there's a difference between do not track and do not target. 
um, you know, do not track as they're not tracking your movements and therefore they can't send you advertisements. Where do not target is they're still tracking everything, but they're just not targeting advertisements at you. And I believe Microsoft has, has stated that this is just, for at least for now, not it's just do not target, which really doesn't stop all of these companies from sucking up all of your personal information. Um, and so that's just another reason why this, you know, may on the surface look like it's good for privacy when in fact, you know, besides undermining um, the whole the whole setup that everybody's been working on for two years, um, but it, you know, it doesn't really even on the surface help users, you know, protect their privacy. So. John, let me ask you this. Um, we're talking about do not track and do not target. Um, do you think that any of this um, relates to or begins to get into the world of just don't serve me ads as well? You know, don't track me, don't target me, and I'm going to block your ads too. Um, it, it could just to the extent that uh, when users have control over how they consume content and whether they you know choose to block ads in a web browser, for instance, sometimes that can really irritate the people that are serving up the content and they want it to be viewed in a particular way. You know, do not track is far beyond, you know, a simple <laughs> user control issue because it requires so much industry buy-in and standard setting and negotiations. Uh, but nevertheless, there's an analogy, um, at least to the simple case of uh, advertising blocking. Um, right, ex exactly. And, and uh, you know, I just, I think that so few people do that, that it's a bit under the radar and it's not as, um, you know, obviously we're all conditioned to seeing ads. We've bought into this ecosystem where various things in our lives, television, the web, um, give us certain things in exchange for displaying advertisements to us. It's how they manage to keep the lights on and the doors open. Um, it, it, to me, do not, it, the, the tracking technologies are sort of an extension of that. Um, it's more insidious and more in the background. Uh, and I think well, it's, that's why it gets legislators and the public up in arms. Well, what kind of interests me about this uh, new move by Microsoft, since I don't really follow the, uh, the privacy angle too much, is mm -hmm. what Microsoft's motivations might be. And I just can't help but seeing it as part of the Cold War between Microsoft and Google and Microsoft not really minding if they make it more difficult to earn your living through advertising or whatever technology online, just because that's what their primary competitor online, Google, does. Okay, so Baron, you were going to tell us what you think is going to happen next. Yeah, this is this is really, I think, much more complicated than people realize. So forgive me if this seems um, uh, if this seems long winded. But let, let me first say just quickly on the point about market share. The, um, mm -hmm. the browser market share number is very, and if you look at other measures, uh, Microsoft appears to have about a fifty percent uh, measure. And it really depends on methodology. So mm -hmm. just suffice it to say that, that Internet Explorer is in the lead. The, the, the real question here is not so much about market share. It, it's more about uh, how high the adoption rate of Do Not Track is. And of course, it's also true that those market share numbers combine multiple versions. And the, the real issue here is that it's going to take time for Internet Explorer 10 to gain significant market share, although I think that's going to happen relatively quickly given that it's bundled with uh, Windows 8. Um, so th that's the first point about that. The second point is, and actually it relates very much to the point that you just raised, uh, I, I think what to me, one of the next dominoes to fall here in my view is that you're, you're likely to see the uh, antivirus software makers uh, in the next versions of their own software include an option that they would describe as protecting users that, uh, that turns do not track on um, either by default or in a very um, uh, somewhat underhanded way. In other words, so somewhat paternalistically, as you say, uh, setting that for users or, or scaring them into doing so. And so however you actually get there, the, the basic fact on the ground is that we're likely to see the adoption rate of Do Not Track grow from what the historic adoption rates have been for uh, opt-outs in the privacy context, which is low single digits to something that is uh, certainly going to exceed what I think is probably industry's acceptable loss threshold, which is something like, just a guess, something like 10, 15%. I, I don't actually know. I don't think anybody really does. 
Uh, but you're, you're likely to see something that's going to start growing. And I don't think it's unrealistic to think that, depending on how this plays out, you could see, um, if Microsoft sticks to its guns here, you could see an adoption rate that gets into the 20, 30, 40, even higher percentage range. And, and that, in terms of understanding what's going to happen here, that's the really mm -hmm. important thing, because that's precisely why, um, in addition to the philosophical point here about users actually making their own choices, that's why industry has insisted that, uh, that this sort of setting not be imposed by default because essentially what we're really talking about here is that at some point there we will cross a tipping point and we will shift from a paradigm that we have today where you can build empowerment tools uh, to let users make choices about this sort of thing and and the cost of doing that for uh, ad supported publishers which is really what this is about it's not about Google directly or, or Yahoo or other companies it's about ultimately the sites that, that they um, sell advertising on and the profits they make from doing that, but, but the profits that fund internet content. The question is, how high does that adoption rate have to be before you uh, go from the current paradigm where, where essentially the opt-out is a no-cost opt-out. You get to free ride, essentially. It's like commercial skipping. You skip the commercial and nothing bad happens to a paradigm in which um, the business model starts to break. And you start seeing uh, some combination of sites imposing paywalls, as, as most newspapers, most large newspapers are starting to do, or um, some sort of negotiation where sites say, well, if, if you want to access content on this site, you have to enable uh, tracking here. And this is where the, 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 the gaming of this gets really um, complicated and, and I think problematic both for the web itself and for those who care about the, the business model that funds this content and funds a diversity of content, which is largely free, as well as uh, for privacy. And, and if you'll indulge me just for a minute, let me try to spin this out for you. Uh, so the, the first question is whether, as I said, Microsoft sticks by its guns. I mean, the, the um, advertising industry has made it very clear that uh, when they said they will respect do not track, this is not what they had in mind. And I think the first thing you're likely to see here is that they will make that very explicit and say, we're not going to respect the header if it's sent by Internet Explorer 10. Mm -hmm. um, that, in turn, is going to cause a great deal of user confusion because it's going to be unclear to users what exactly is happening. Just as today, it's pretty unclear to users when they turn on Do Not Track in Firefox what actually happens. And the answer is largely nothing because, again, there is no standard yet. The second thing that's going to happen is there's going to be a political outcry when um, – when advertisers do that, as if somehow this is this is their fault and they're doing instead of um, the deck being or the, the the rug being pulled out from under them, if you will, and the the um, fundamental ground rules of this conversation changing, and so you're going to have a, a, a split. So Microsoft split decision, a fork in the road. Microsoft potentially could back off and say, okay, we're going to build out a um, a privacy wizard that maybe will let people choose in the same way that they perhaps they should have done to start, or they could stick by their guns. Uh, but however that works out, I think bottom line, they're either going to stay with what they're doing today, or they're going to design that user choice mechanism in such a way as to get a fairly high adoption rate. And so again, in, in either case, I think you're going to end up seeing that we go well past that tipping point. And this is where things start to get um, interesting and potentially messy. And I think potentially quite bad for privacy. So imagine the world that starts to exist when companies really have to build that choice infrastructure that can facilitate a negotiation. Um, you're, you're, on the one hand, I think you're going to see that there is in total less revenue created. Uh, the estimate is that um, ads that are tailored to users' interests across multiple sites can produce something on the order of three times as much revenue, and for some sites, a lot more revenue, because the comparison isn't, isn't, isn't even. It's a question of how much is contextual advertising worth. And if you're a site that, for example, sells, um, if, you, if you have electronics reviews, your advertising is probably worth a lot because advertisers are willing to pay good money for camera ads, let's just say. On the other hand, if you're trying to support commentary or uh, local news about your community, your contextual advertising isn't worth very much. And so the difference for some websites and revenue is going to be a lot greater. And you're going to see some sites that are going to be quite desperate for revenue. They're going to have to do something. They may lay off people. They may produce less content. You may see consolidation in the industry. But I think at, at the end of the day, what you're really going to see is a shift from the model that we have today where anybody can set up a, um, 
uh, a website and they can use a number of competing ad platforms to provide revenue uh, to one in which uh, there will be a, a great uh, reduction in the number of ad platforms and ad companies that are actually able to get uh, essentially an opt-in for tracking. And so in that rather perverse sense, what you're really talking about is taking the advertising network model today and turning that into a, um, uh, a, a federated model where, where revenue really only flows through a certain limited number of players uh, and you're more closely tied to those players. And, and ironically, that actually might end up being better for Google. It could be that why ever Microsoft did this, uh, they end up helping Google more. Um, it could be that Microsoft thinks they're going to fare better in that world because they've always done well in providing authenticated services. They, they were very close to uh, years ago uh, endorsing an age verification mandate. And they just by happenstance produced the software that could be used to do that feasibly. Um, but however that shakes out, what you're likely to see is, uh, again, something, an emergence of something like a walled garden. So it won't necessarily look that much different from the internet today where you browse as you, as you see fit, except that you'll be going either within or, or sometimes without outside of the network that you're used to. And if you've already opted in, let's just say to, uh, to, to tracking inside Google's network, you may be able to navigate that world in the same way you do today because you've essentially turned off do not track for Google's advertising purposes and they are willing to let you keep uh, getting that content for free. But if you go outside that that world, uh, you're going to have pop-ups that pop up that ask you to add another exemption. It's not clear exactly today how that's going to work. There's no spec for that. We're, we're only really at the beginning stages of designing the basic spec of what do not track itself means. We have really no idea what that sort of negotiation might look like. Uh, or again, you get a paywall or you get some other um, mechanism that that is ultimately going to discourage users from leaving those networks uh, and also encourage the sites themselves, the publishers. Ironically, you could wind up with a situation where this actually drives consolidation in the industry, potentially uh, allowing those sites to um, collect more information, not not less, because if they've got to get some user buy-in, if you've got to click on a terms of service or or essentially uh, agree to subs- you know, subscribe, in a sense, to a network by allowing them to um, to track you, they can build in lots of other things that they might not have uh, asked for today. So I, I worry, to summarize all of this, not only about the overall health of the e- internet ecosystem and the ad revenue that supports it, but also about the um, the ultimate privacy consequences here. I think people should be careful what they wish for and realize that, you know, uh, as in physics, for every action, there is always an opposite uh, reaction. And this is not just going to play out in a simple form where users get to just turn on do not track and the internet goes on just the same way it does today. You're going to see a complex series of um, of these things play out. And it's not clear to anybody today how that's going to work or what it's going to look like. And I think we'll look back on this moment with great regret that something that could have evolved in a more organic, natural process uh, through Internet standard settings bodies um, was essentially forced. Um, and, and, and in that regard, let me just say in conclusion that I... I'm going to be very careful here about jumping to assumptions about Microsoft's motives. I mean, it's certainly true that they and Google have this Hatfields and McCoy uh, rivalry going on, and they're they're lobbying antitrust suits at each other. They they really they've gotten quite vicious, and and uh, I think that I think we probably all agree on this call that that's bad for the entire internet. But but I'm not sure that it's so simple here as that Microsoft thought that this was a way to screw over Google. Uh, I, I think instead uh, the more likely explanation, although it, could be both things, uh, is that the Federal Trade Commission played a significant role here in pressuring uh, Microsoft to do this. And I say that for a few reasons. Um, But the first of them is that um, they already did this. Uh, Two weeks ago, uh, as we mentioned or alluded to, uh, Twitter announced that it would be supporting uh, or recognizing the Do Not Track header. Uh, And before they could even make their announcement that day, uh, that news was announced by uh, Ed Felton, the chief technology officer, chief technologist at the Federal Trade Commission. And they announced it as a win for the FTC. And I think in doing that, they really showed their hands that they were clearly involved in this conversation. Um, I, I want to be careful about speculating too much, except to say that um, 
there's a lot of pressure on companies like Twitter. Twitter itself has been the subject of both privacy investigations and an open antitrust investigation that was started by um, Tim Wu, who is better known as the father of net neutrality. He was my internet law professor, someone I like very much, good guy, uh, fun person to um, play uh, uh, Dungeons and Dragons with, but also someone <laughs> who's got a very different vision for how regulators should operate. And and I just would note here, in case I sound too conspiratorial, that he actually wrote a paper last year on what he calls agency threats, which is where uh, the FTC might, for example, go to a company like Twitter or Microsoft and say, hey, you, you really want to be a good corporate player, don't you? You should, you should turn on Do Not Track by default. And maybe if you do, maybe we'll back off on, on these various other things. Well, to some of us, that sounds like uh, Don Corleone from The Godfather. But for Tim, even though he actually references The Godfather in that paper, he says, eh, you know, not so bad. That's, if, as long as it's used for good ends and, uh, and by good people, that's a good model. And, you know, I mean, that's pretty disturbing to me. That's uh, basically the same thing in my mind as uh, what we saw last uh, spring a year ago where Joe Lieberman was able to exercise the soft power that he enjoys as chairman of the Senate Intelligence Committee to make a single phone call to Amazon and say something along the lines of, uh, hey, you want to be good Americans, don't you? You don't really want to support these uh, terrorist uh, friends, uh, friends of terrorism at WikiLeaks, do you? And when he did that, one phone call, Amazon shut off web hosting services. It's, it's easy to criticize a company like Amazon in a case like that. But at the end of the day, we have to remember that government um, exercises vast power in, in these ways over companies. Uh, this is how the Chinese regulate the Internet. They call it uh, self-discipline. Uh, and while we don't like to admit it, this is what uh, our government does. And I think it, yeah. there are lots of reasons to think here that uh, that this particular FTC, which has been uh, fairly desperate for a win on privacy and to show some results, uh, they wanted to change the debate here. They wanted to shake things up. And they pressured, I'm sure, to some extent, uh, Microsoft into doing this thing that, again, at the end of the day, the first consequence of this is to break the very process that has been ongoing for nine months that actually would have given us a workable definition of do not track. Um, well, it and, still so me, can, can't it? I mean, Microsoft has it, maybe jumped the gun a bit, but the W3C well, group yeah, is I'm not going saying to that, continue its work. I'm not saying that process is going to stop. I'm, I'm looking forward to participating in it myself. What I am saying is that um, uh, that process rests on an assumption that is completely contrary to what Microsoft has done. And at the very least, you're, you're going to get into a situation where the only way that that process works going forward is if you, know, you essentially have a two-speed system where some do not track headers are respected because they're set by browsers like Firefox where the user has to activate that choice. And in other browsers like Internet Explorer 8 uh, and potentially things that are set by antivirus software, the companies just uh, say we're not going to respect that choice and the Federal Trade Commission at that point can't hold them to doing so. And you wind up with a situation where you no longer have do not track as a single effective mechanism for this. And, and then things get, and I apologize when I, I said earlier this was complicated, but things get really messy when you start to think about how the Europeans are going to react here. Because this entire conversation here in the U.S. has been um, operating in the shadow of the question of how the European Union's e-privacy directive is going to be updated. And without getting into too much detail about it, just suffice it to say that it's very easy for me to imagine a scenario in which um, you, the Europeans essentially say that um, what they currently <laughs> interpret the directive to mean is that uh, uh, you can only, you can only uh, collect information from a user where, where that is strictly necessary for a purpose that they have requested. And that they would say that if someone sends a header, that they are indicating their preference not to have any tracking um, conducted at all, and while in the U.S., we might say, well, if, if the advertising industry has, has said they'll respect headers set by users but not other headers, uh, in Europe, I'm not sure that's going to work. And in Europe, the consequence of this can be much more draconian because what this actually could mean is not merely blocking uh, a specific use, which is what um, we were talking about earlier. That this is not so much a, a collection uh, restriction as it is a use specification restriction, 
But in Europe, it actually could be interpreted as a don't place cookies, don't track me at all restriction, in which case what we're talking about here is not merely wiping out um, particularly uh, lucrative revenue for advertising, but potentially stopping the tracking that's necessary for all forms of advertising and for analytics. And the consequences of that start to get quite messy. So well, let me stop there and just say that this is we, we really have no idea where we're going at this point. And um, it didn't have to it didn't have to be this way, <laughs> as they say in the movies. Right. Well, I'm sure that the W3C will, will continue its good work toward a standard, but there's really not much you can do if one of the market players decides to forge ahead and try something out. You know, I'm sure Microsoft thought this through and it's fun to speculate as to the reasons why it might have done so. One thing that occurred to me is that Microsoft works so much with enterprise clients um, and, you know, not that... Um, well, let's put it this way. We just ha discussed last week on This Week in Law how IBM, IBM uh, barred Siri from coming into its enterprise environment. And I could see where, you know, it could be an IT kind of decision that uh, if we have a choice about tracking on our browsers, we'd, we'd like it to be off by default. And it just makes it easy for uh, Microsoft's enterprise clients if they take that tack. Now, that's me just completely... I'm talking off the top of my head and speculating. Uh, you opened so many uh, cans of worms in that uh, discussion, Baron. I'm, I'm scarcely um, uh, able to decide where to start the next question. But I think um, for Trevor, uh, all of this is talking about using technology to alter the way that things are consumed and making some decisions about that. Um, is Microsoft, do you think, opening itself up to, say, a copyright challenge in deciding to make uh, Do Not Track the um, default in IE10? Um, a copyright challenge in what respect? You in mean? that they are altering the way that sites are served. They're, the, you know, if they're served up intending to have tracking involved, Microsoft is, you know, essentially slamming the door on that. And I, I raise this because I, I sort of see a parallel, and I realize it's, it's a bit of a stretch, but uh, maybe you guys can bear with me, between what's going on here and what's going on with respect to the Hopper uh, Dish Network's product that uh, enables people to skip ads. And EFF is weighing in on that and mm -hmm. filing briefs, et cetera, in support. It did so um, way back when with Replay, saying, you know what, people get to monkey around and decide how they consume the things that um, are served to them. And if they want to drop ads, that's something the technology can do. And we shouldn't interfere with that. And there's no copyright reason why that should happen. Um, do, do you think that a similar challenge might be brought here? Uh, well, I mean, I certainly hope not. And, you know, I think the point you bring up is a good one because this, you know, the, the suit against Dish Network for this new uh, program that, that skips commercials isn't really a copyright thing. It's, um, you know, they're going after, so, I mean, to fill in users who don't know, um, basically Dish, Dish Network has this new DVR program where it records uh, primetime programs for an eight-day span automatically, and users can skip commercials after a few hours um, of, after it initially airs. And three of the major networks sued them last week in federal court, uh, arguing that it infringes their copyright. Um, and, you know, this is just the first of a series of events that have happened over the last few months that really show that, you know, these content networks are using copyright law to try to hold on to their dying businesses instead of actually innovating and changing their business models and, you know, catering to consumers instead of trying to force things down their throat. Um, you know, there's a great example in another case over a company called Aereo, which is a New York startup that tries to bring local broadcast TV to the internet. Uh, they've also been sued. Um, and these, these 
uh, content companies are, are using the excuse that they're trying to save free, free TV uh, when, in fact, it's just the user's choice. You know, we've had DVR uh, products for years that can skip commercials. You know, we can put on, you know, we can hit the mute button and close our eyes if we want, if we don't want to watch commercials. Um, you know, they're basically saying that, you know, uh, if you don't watch commercials, they're losing jobs. When in fact, they're just refusing to innovate and change the way that they bring content to consumers. Like, for example, Hulu uh, last month announced that they're going to start uh, charging people for everything if you don't have a cable subscription. So, you know, they're seeing people cutting the cord, so to speak, and moving to using the internet only for their TV watching. And they're trying to hold on with every last grasp they have. And unfortunately, it's not going to work. And hopefully, uh, we're going to see these copyright suits. Um, or Dish Network is actually going to fight this, which is great, because 10 years ago, uh, with the other, the other company you mentioned, Hopper, um, or Replay, I'm sorry, uh, they essentially got sued out of business. And it was never really determined whether this was a copyright violation or not. So hopefully, we're going to see in the next few months that this is actually going to play out in the courts and this will be ruled, you know, not a copyright infringement. And, you know, if there was ever a situation where do not track um, where, where Microsoft or whoever could bring a suit or against Microsoft saying that mm -hmm. this was, um, you know, a copyright violation would be thrown out. Yeah. Um, Crucial Wax in our IRC says, I have zero sympathy for an advertising company that can't make a go of it without tracking me. Adapt. And, you know, it's sort of the same uh, concept when you turn it to DVRs. Um, you know, if you can't find a business model that works without letting me drop out the ads, you know, certainly copyright isn't the vehicle for solving that problem. Uh, John, any thoughts on any of this? Yeah, well, in a lot of ways, I think that the Dishes Hopper DVR, although it is disruptive and it's an important technology, I think the networks are somewhat blowing it out of proportion because uh, networks make a significant amount of money from the retransmission fees that are paid by companies like Dish. So it's not as though if somehow people never watched any ads ever again that they would be deprived of all revenue. They would just have to, uh, you know, they'd have to change a little bit, but the mechanism for that change is already in place. But uh, more importantly, I mean, this is a really obvious point, but the, the Hopper DVR doesn't allow people to skip ads on live TV. Um, so it is uh, really, I, I, I think it's a really precipitous uh, series of lawsuits, and I think they're going to regret them, not just legally, because I think their claims don't have any real legal merit, but also uh, just in terms of what the public thinks, because... Uh, People are absolutely outraged because the theories that the networks have put forward say that any time a user doesn't watch a commercial when he records a show with the intention of uh, not watching the commercials later, he's a copyright infringer. Um, if you actually read the text of their complaints, um, they make uh, secondary liability claims against DISH, uh, which hinge on the underlying direct liability being uh, done by the user. Uh, and I think that is uh, a pretty bad mistake, uh, especially considering that home recording and time shifting has uh, really been legal since 1984 when the Supreme Court uh, issued its, ba its uh, pretty landmark uh, Betamax decision. Right. So if I can I jump in here. Sure, I, jump I, in I real quick, and then we're going to take a break in a moment. You've hit a really important parallel that what we're really talking about here is the their business models. So I'm certainly not one to say that the government should get involved here to force anybody to watch commercials or that that's an appropriate role for copyright. But but I do think that the key point here is that uh, it's it's very easy for someone to say, hey, adapt, you know, I'm going to break this business model and it's your problem if you can't, uh, if you can't innovate around that. But what that really misses is that advertising is, it, it it's annoying to people, but advertising plays a really critical role in supporting media because media is an information good. It's something that has a, a marginal cost of zero. And as any economist will tell you to make this really simple, in the long term, uh, price will ultimately fall to marginal cost. Just to say that the, the, the tendency here uh, is always for, for prices in this field to, to be zero. And the question then is how you pay for content. And I'm not saying there aren't other ways to do that as well. But I am saying that if we uh, 
push towards solutions, and especially where the government gets involved in the way that I was hinting, has probably happened here with what appears to have just been Microsoft's decision, but was probably in part due to the FTC's pressure. Uh, if, if you push towards that solution, you ultimately are going to reduce the amount of revenue that's available. Even if companies innovate and find other ways to, to, to support their content, you can still make everybody worse off. And at the end of the day, what we're talking about here is it's not just big corporate media. We're talking about the, the health, the diversity, the vibrancy of media of all kinds in this country. And it's not just uh, a big television companies, as in the case here with commercial skipping, when we talk about the internet, we're talking about mom and pop sites, blogs, nonprofits, people all around the internet that, that actually rely on this revenue. And I just think we have to be really careful about assuming that, uh, as uh, Chris Segoyan always says to me with a smirk on his face, that your broken business model is not my problem. So it, it, it actually is our problem when we go around breaking all the business models, and, and in particular the business model that has really supported media in this country for, for 300 years. It's just not an accident that that happens, and it's not an accident that it's given value by uh, tracking because it actually helps those ads be relevant and useful and therefore worth paying for for uh, advertisers. Right, Absolutely. but I mean, it, it, may, it may break their business model, and it may be a shame, but it doesn't mean it would be copyright infringement. I think there's a difference. Yeah, and I, I'm not... I'm not saying it is, so I'm not getting involved in the copyright conversation here, and I tend to share your skepticism of those suits. But I, I just want to say as a, as a broader policy matter, there is a common thread in these debates that advertising is bad, wasteful, a problem for users, we'd be better off without it. And I just want to warn people that there is no free lunch, and advertising, to the extent that anything is free today, it's free because of advertising. And in both cases here, we're talking about, about undermining that key business model, and especially in the case of, of privacy and, and do not track. No, I mean, it's a, good, it's a good point because, uh, I mean, I think if you would ask each individual, uh, you know, what do you want? Would you rather it be free or would you rather be tracked online? Or would you rather be tracked online and be free or would you rather you pay for it? It would be interesting to see these companies such as Google, you know, the major companies, Google, Microsoft, uh, Facebook say, OK, well, we will either track you and you can use our services for free or you can pay a small fee, say, you know, 20 or 50, 25 or 50 dollars a year and we won't track you at all. And I'm wondering what you think of, of that way, that route. So, you know, you can kind of yeah. so you know, split. I like it. The you know, Pandora innovation. model. Uh, yeah, I, I'm happy to see that happen. It clearly can work for some kinds of content. Uh, Pandora, it's worked for, for books and certain forms of media where there's some scarcity. But I think we have to be very careful about blithely assuming that that will work for everything because that model, I, it, it runs into a few problems. So one is that the examples that people point to are, again, models where there is a limited scarcity, generally because of copyright. Uh, that model works particularly poorly where we're talking about information goods that are not copyrightable, uh, such as the, the news stories itself. In other words, if I write a story on my uh, site about a news story, I can't copyright the facts. I can't stop you from, um, from writing your own story about that. Now, if we lived in a world where we had really robust copyright, which I don't think anybody on this call wants, where you could copyright facts, you could more easily build a paid business model on that. But the fact of the matter is that precisely because we don't have that system, because copyright is limited, it's very difficult to get people to pay for that con for content they can get from a diversity of sources. And competition will always tend to drive those prices down to zero. So that's the first problem. The second problem is the costs of building that choice architecture are, are not insignificant. And here, uh, without getting into too much detail, let me just remind everyone that this entire field uh, all revolves around what are essentially uh, economic problems. And the entire discipline today of law and economics revolves around a single insight that Ronald Coase had, the great economist, uh, about the uh, uh, FCC and how it deals with spectrum, but more generally about property rights, which is that in, a, in the perfect world, where you set property rights, whether it's for spectrum or copyright or grazing rights for sheep or anything else, doesn't matter because people will negotiate to reach the same outcome. But his point in saying that was that in the real world, where we actually have limited time, information, money, 
and building choice architecture like negotiating between a, your, your browser and a website and all those other realities of, of, of the real world, those things cause the outcome to be different. In other words, if you change the default, you end up getting radically different outcomes. And my core fear here is that on the assumption that oh, it'll work, it'll work itself out, but basically the revenue differences will be minimal, the business model will just change, you actually could wind up shifting the equilibrium from one today where you get a significant amount of money. And we're talking about, I think it's $11 billion a year, something like that for display ad revenue in the US. It goes to, to a long tail of publishers as well as to big ones to a scenario in which the total amount of revenue is far smaller and it goes to a smaller, more concentrated uh, number of players. And so you end up harming not only the total ecosystem, but diversity of media, which is the thing that, you know, folks like EFF and our friends at Public Knowledge and other uh, media people who worry about media consolidation typically are worried about. Those values are all in tension here. And, and I think that's in part why the FTC and why Congress have been so reluctant to act uh, overtly here and why they're falling back on what Tim Wu, again, called the agency threat model, which is just coerce on the margins, get people to move little by little, and hope that you don't break the whole system. Okay, so let me give you a um, concrete example. Let me give us all a concrete example of innovating with the advertising model, which we do here at Twit. Um, and I'll go ahead and drop our ad into the proceedings here, but go a little meta on it and just mention that, you know, of course, we're not tracking you with our advertising uh, and that our ads are carefully selected. You know, we're not dropping in ads that uh, advertisers come to us and say, you know, hey, we're going to pay you X amount of dollars and throw this in your show. And we're very selective about what goes on to the advertising here at twit.tv. They're products that we genuinely think that our users can use, that we often use ourselves and that, you know, we think have real value. Um, also, we definitely make sure that our advertisers are giving people the opportunity to try things for themselves. They get a great opportunity to um, go in and do a free trial of almost all the things we advertise and uh, get bonuses over and above what they would get if they had not listened to and uh, heard about it on our show. So uh, before I go ahead and uh, tell you more about ShareFile, who is our sponsor for this show, I, ju I just will mention that we're here with Baron Soka from Tech Freedom, and um, we're here with John Bergmeier from Public Knowledge, and Trevor Tim from EFF having a great discussion about the fundamentals of our economy and the internet economy in particular, um, advertising, do not track copyright, uh, Entertainment, as you know it, we're going to get to in a while, and a huge decision uh, from the court in the Oracle versus Google case. But our sponsor this week is ShareFile, and uh, we really encourage you to check it out for yourself. You, um, I mentioned uh, doing business in the enterprise. I have been part of an enterprise before. For folks uh, who are not real familiar with me, I worked at a big law firm for many, many years. And uh, when you're work whether you're working in that kind of an environment or you're a professional on your own, you need to present a professional uh, business uh, tool for folks to work with. And what's happening more and more these days is reaching out to tools out there that fill a need um, in this particular need, sharing enormous media or other digital files. Um, that you cannot include, you know, our broadband infrastructure has, has leaped uh, miles and miles ahead. But still, you know, if we're talking about sharing enormous files, uh, you're going to have to not just worry about how fast those things go across, but what's there to catch them on the other side. Um, and you need to have a trusted partner to do that with. So rather than going out and using one of the myriad of free services, you don't know about their encryption, you don't know, you know, who they are really, um, you do know who Citrix is. They have been serving the business world for years and years and they have created this tool that really gives you what you need to survive in today's digital world. You can collaborate with clients and coworkers. You can send and share those important huge files uh, in real time, securely and completely under your control. 
by using ShareFile from Citrix. It's a secure file sharing solution built specifically for business. It offers a full suite of desktop and mobile options that enable you to easily collaborate from anywhere, anytime. There's an Outlook plugin that allows you to easily receive and send files of almost any size directly from Outlook email, which we know is sort of king in the enterprise. And you no longer need to worry about if a file is too big to send. Uh, you want to be able to, when I was working in big law firms, um, we always had this thing called the extranet, which was constantly being built out and was difficult to use. And it just, you know, was kind of more trouble than it was worth. ShareFile becomes your extranet. It is completely customizable to your own uh, graphics, look and feel of your website, etc. And it serves that purpose that you need seamlessly of being able to share a file with very fine-grained permissions, um, have it be there available for a limited amount of time so it's not just hanging out there on a server um, in an, un, you know, not that it's ever unsecure, but you just, you'd want to know that af after a certain amount of time, it's going to go away when you need it to go away. And of course, if you need to share it again, you can do that again. Um, it's the perfect solution for any business. It's a really incredible offer that we've got for you. You're going to get a 30-day free trial, plus not just the same amount of storage that you might get from any other free trial. You're going to get twice that. So I want you to really go out and try it, uh, share some enormous files, and see how great the service is. You go to sharefile.com, click the radio microphone, enter the promo code TWIL, T-W-I-L, that's sharefile.com. Click the mic and type in Twill. We thank them so much for their support. Now, I'm actually going to work in a legal question for Trevor based on the way we do ads here at Twit. Uh, as I said, we work them uh, into the discussion. They're not just dropped in. It's not some actor or actress uh, coming in and telling you about Sharefile. It's the hosts generally that do that. Um, it, Trevor, do you think that... Uh, first of all, let me back up a second and say... I am having a, tr a terrible time getting my head around how uh, the networks are arguing that there's copyright infringement regarding the hopper at all. Um, okay. Because a, a, in my own mind, the copyrighted material, the creative works are the shows themselves. And if you're saying yeah. that the entire broadcast with its ads is a copyrighted work, then that's one thing I suppose you could make that argument. Do you think I, that that's where they're going? And do you think well, it makes a difference if you do ads the way that we do them? I don't want to steal the question from Trevor, but uh, sure. I, actually, ahead, I actually have a really good answer to this because what they have to do, watching a commercial is not an infringement of any of the copyright holders' rights, and it can't be. Um, so what they have to do is say recording that is making a reproduction. They're saying that when you're recording with the intent to skip a commercial later, that violates copyright because it's not a fair use recording. While as recording to watch a, a show later with the commercials intact, well, that's OK. That's essentially the argument. It's a weird argument. And they would definitely prefer it to simply be illegal to skip commercials per se. And in fact, in 2004, um, Orrin Hatch, I believe, in something called the Pirate Act, introduced language that would make it illegal to fast forward through commercials. Uh, that would be a much cleaner way to go about it. It's definitely cumbersome the way they're doing it through copyright. And, uh, and I just have to say this. We have a letter right now on publicknowledge.org. If you click on our Act Now section, where we're going to give it to the network executives that are suing DISH. And we want to show it to DISH's competitors, too, to show the demand for this sort of service. Uh, which you can sign to express your outrage if you're a viewer and you're yourself being accused of copyright infringement for fast-forwarding commercials. But uh, your, your basic point, Denise, is that it doesn't really make sense because copyright law is not designed to, uh, to affect this. Mm -hmm. Right. So what you're saying is, is it's going back to that Betamax decision and the fair use decision hung there on the time shifting aspect of what the v the VCR did. Um, yeah, and that they're basically saying that if you're not recording to time shift, you're recording for some other purpose, then you're out of luck on fair use. Yeah, their legal argument is actually pretty amazing because it's saying that the technology of the '80s. They're they're not saying, well, Betamax was wrong, overturn it. They're not they're not you know challenging the Supreme Court just yet. 
but they're saying, well, Betamax really only applies to 80s style technology. And if you make your and if you improve your home recording technology at all by automating anything that users could already do manually, well, no, that's a, that that's a copyright violation. And I think that's an absolutely uh, you know crazy sort of convoluted claim. And it just reaches to the fact that copyright law doesn't say that you can't fast forward through commercials. Although, you know, again, they, they wish it did. Right. Yeah, there's a huge difference between <laughs> protecting your copyright and then use, or using or abusing copyright law to maximize your profits. And I think that's what we're seeing here. It's, you know, it, it's not actually a copyright problem. They're just trying to use the law in a way um, to, you know, blow a hole uh, into the whole system where they can essentially claim copyright for everything. And I think we saw this in the SOPA debate too, where these, these companies would have gotten, uh, you know, basically complete immunity, um, for, um, you know, censoring other websites. Like ISPs could have gotten immunity if they started censoring websites by themselves. And obviously these ISPs are also owned by content companies, um, you know, Comcast, NBC being one, where, uh, you know, the content company can say, oh, this this so-and-so website is infringing our copyright. And then their ISP would be able to censor them with no punishment. And this may have stopped some copyright infringers, but it obviously would have been used to shut down emerging competitors. And this is this is the kind of tactics that they're resorting to now that they see that their, you know, their profits are sinking because the internet is changing the game. And like I was saying before, I think it's just the the one step in a series of moves they're making to kind of, you know, you know, morph copyright law into their their the only way that they can gain profits at this point. Yeah, copyright holders like are only hurting themselves if they abuse copyright law and they they twist copyright law to serve ends it was never meant to serve because that actually undermines the entire premise of copyright law. And I believe in copyright law. I believe there are legitimate things it it can do and is supposed to accomplish. And uh, those legitimate goals are harmed when copyright law is used to uh, preserve business models or to take down websites or other things that's not intended to do. Right. I, I have to just jump in here for a moment to uh, applaud what John just said. It's uh, it's a relief to hear someone, it's a copyright critic, uh, affirm that in fact they, they will defend copyright in some cases. I, I do worry that some of the folks who um, who share my skepticism about copyright, and, and it's worth pointing out here that all three of our organizations, EFF, Public Knowledge, and Tech Freedom, were on the same side against SOPA. Um, but I do worry <laughs> that some critics of copyright um, – basically never met a copyright uh, action or right that they actually liked or would defend. And some of those folks are willing to go quite far in defending wholesale infringement that I think, I would hope, we all agree are, are not uh, not things that we actually want to allow. So I, I agree with John. There is a valid purpose for copyright here that's probably undermined by going so far as, uh, as suits like this. Okay, well, thus far we've been talking about uh, the entire economics of advertising and upending the way things have worked traditionally. Uh, there are some sites and services out there who are attempting to do the same thing with broadcast television. Uh, we mentioned ARIO, which had a big hearing on Thursday in New York. John, why don't you tell us what ARIO is and what the hearing was about? Sure. Uh, Aries of Service, uh, I believe it's Aereo, but you never know what these made up. You never know what these made up words, how they're really supposed to be pronounced. But uh, it's a service that lets you watch free over the air TV that you already could see with an antenna, but it lets you watch it on your computer. Um, it's as simple as that. Um, this has to do with the fact that digital TV, although the signal quality is better, sometimes it's harder to receive. You need a better antenna. Uh, if you move your antenna an inch, you might lose the signal. That's inconvenient, so some people want to have a better solution. Um, Aereo provides that solution. Um, they're being accused of copyright infringement um, they're, because uh, it's being said that they are retransmitting uh, copyrighted content over the Internet. But uh, Aereo has uh, set up its system where each user has uh, an individual antenna. So Aereo's argument, which uh, we agree with, uh, EFF and Public Knowledge work together on a, an amicus brief in this case, is that it does not constitute a copyright infringement to take the antenna that you already have attached to your TV and uh, move it into another building. And this follows the uh, Cablevision precedent, which was in the Second Circuit, which is governing law uh, in the Aereo case, 
where the court found that if you take a DVR and you move it away from underneath your TV and you move it into some other building, it doesn't suddenly start infringing copyright. All right. So uh, this hearing, there was a preliminary injunction hearing on Thursday. There has not yet been a determination. Um, Can you bring us up to speed there? Did you get any feel for how things are going? Yeah. um, uh, Judge Nathan, who is presiding in this case, is uh, remarkably well-informed and by all accounts uh, gave both sides the business. In other words, she knows the facts and she knows the law. So I think that's really a good sign uh, if, like me, you think that the facts and the law are uh, on your side. But, you know, regardless, I think we can look forward to a a pretty well-reasoned opinion. And it's important to remember that at a preliminary injunction stage, which this is at, it's not about whether or not Aereo is infringing copyright. It's about whether it should be shut down while they hold the trial. So while it's important to... uh, you know, to look to the merits, that's one of the factors that you look into in deciding whether to grant a preliminary injunction. It's not the only factor. There are other public interest factors. There's the question of whether any harms can be remedied through the payment of damages and uh, and what the interest of the public is and th- things along that nature. So uh, even if you think that Aereo is violating the law here, um, that doesn't say that they should be shut down before they've had the opportunity to fully uh, defend themselves at a trial. All right. Well, uh, we talked about retransmission consent and how that comes into play here. Uh, Trevor, what's the Next Generation Television Marketplace Act and uh, how does it relate to what we're discussing? Well, actually, I can, I, I'm just going to want to go back to something John said. Oh, sure. I think it's really important. Um, he was talking about how uh, you know, it, it's important that they, um, you know, get their day in court before they get shut down. And that's another problem that we've seen a lot in, in these copyright suits, or I mean, cop, cop, criminal copyright cases, where the, uh, there have been hundreds of websites that have been seized uh, by the U.S. government and essentially shut down with a giant banner across them saying that they've been seized by the U.S. government uh, before they ever get to trial. And it's become a real First Amendment problem. And, and it's probably gone, I think, um, you know, it, it's, it's been underreported. Um, the fact that these websites are being taken down a lot of times with flimsy evidence and they've essentially been cens- censored and shut down and put out of business and um, then essentially never given a trial. There was a great case uh, about a hip-hop website called The Jazz One uh, that came out a few months ago where their website was seized for over a year and the government was claiming that they were infringing on copyright where, and in fact, uh, as the New York Times reported, that they were actually being given songs by hip-hop artists like um, Puff Daddy and Jay-Z. And even record executives were giving them songs to put on their website to promote um, and the Justice Department ended up seizing their their website, and uh, it went on. The case went on for over a year, and after a year of the their lawyers, you know, begging to be this case to be heard in front of a judge, the uh, Justice Department just dropped the case. No apology, no nothing, and their business was ruined because of it. And we've seen this over and over again. And a lot of times, um, these cases are but just to, you know, essentially, you know, destroy their business um, and and not have to actually prove this in court. And I think that's um, really important uh, in the Aereo case where, you know, the judge hopefully will end up deciding that they actually get a trial before being found guilty, essentially, because, you know, without being able to operate their system uh, while, you know, the court is deciding... Um, they're, they'll be essentially be put out of business anyways. And either way, the the um, content holders win. All right. Well, so, uh, let's see. We, we've got um, this act. Please, can I jump in? Here? I was asking you about. Yes, please jump in. Yeah, so uh, this act, the uh, Video um, Television Marketplace Act, uh, mm-hmm. this is really quite important. I think we need to step back and understand what the context here is. So, uh, is so just briefly uh, what we've been talking today about is uh, about retransmission consent, as you say, and that's essentially mm-hmm. 
the right of broadcasters to withhold their signal from someone that would retransmit it, whether that's a cable system or uh, some potentially new company like um, like ARIO. Um, that is just one piece of very complicated uh, legal system that was put in place uh, by the Congress, um, starting in the 70s and then uh, winding up ultimately with the, um, the various cable acts uh, in the 1980s and, and 1990s. Uh, it's, it's extremely elaborate, and, and I think suffice it to say without getting into the details that we, I probably would agree here with John that um, – that really is, it's an old system of subsidies put in place to protect uh, incumbents and established business models. And, and it's not one that we should, um, we should support. And, and I think that you'd probably find some pretty broad agreement that there's a lot of good in those provisions of this bill, which has been sponsored by um, uh, Representative Scalise in the House and Senator DeMint in the Senate. Uh, who are very two very free market bills? Uh, they're they're uh, two, excuse me two very free market members. They're people that uh, I don't think public knowledge has often agreed with. But but I think John, you can jump in here. I think that yeah. with the exception of the media ownership changes that are also in that bill, that there's a lot of uh, of good in the bill. We'd probably all agree on that. But yeah. and it, you want to jump in before I continue? Yeah. So. So, yeah, I actually recently wrote a white paper on what I see as the future of video, which I will plug. It's called Tomorrow Vision, and you can get it at publicknowledge.org slash Tomorrow Vision. And uh, I actually do agree that the DeMint bill is a good end for like a good end state. And I think that we should aim to get rid of some of the archaic and weird cross subsidies and behavioral style regulations that are. Uh, that really distort and complicate the video marketplace. I might disagree with uh, with with the mint and supporters of that bill because I ultimately think that we need to have a more competitive marketplace uh, before it's deregulated. In other words, I think that the some of the incumbents have gamed the system for so long that if you precipitously deregulate it, uh, they'd be able to simply lock in their advantage uh, for many years to come, and I think that would be unfortunate. And I might disagree about you know you know how to apply antitrust law or other more general structural style regulations uh to the video marketplace but not to treat the video marketplace as this special little you know weird market that needs all these odd uh regulations so um i'm actually quite sympathetic which often surprises people uh to uh the next generation video marketplace act i think it might be a little premature but i think uh i think ultimately it, it shows that there's wide agreement that the current system of uh, media regulation um, is outdated. It doesn't serve the public. It doesn't serve competition. It doesn't serve programmers, uh, independent programmers particularly. And uh, one way or another, it's got to go. So here, here, I'm glad to hear that, John. Where I was going with this is to say that there are many pieces of that puzzle, and they include things like um, must carry, which we don't need to explain here. But let, let's just say they, they all fit together. Retransmission consent is part of that. And essentially what it does, it, retransmission consent, is it, 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 is the, it was Congress's response to um, a long development of case law in the 50s and 60s that said that uh, at the end of the day, you as a broadcaster don't have a copyright because there's no performance in your signal. Now, the people who own the underlying programming, the show, the you know, old episodes of Seinfeld, Maybe you, the broadcaster, in your own news program, uh, the, the, the commercial owners, they have the rights, but you, the broadcaster, have no right in the overall signal. And this is where this debate has really, uh, I think, been, been stuck uh, on some level. And, and I would just refer everyone here to my colleague, Ryan Roddy at the Competitive Enterprise Institute, uh, has written a, a great post really delving into this question of retransmission consent. And he, he wrestles with this. He's very supportive of the bill. But ultimately comes out and says that uh, at, at we still probably need some sort of statutory uh, retransmission consent right uh, because there's no copyright in that. Uh, in precisely in order to say that if, if a, another company wants to negotiate with a broadcaster to uh, transmit their signal, to retransmit it, that they actually need to have a right to do that. Because if you take that away, the broadcasters at that point have no right. And you, you've disintermediated them as a channel, and you basically just go to a, uh, a world where everything becomes a la carte, the programming from the, the network, the local programming. Uh, and that's not necessarily a good world, but at least having that right gives them some uh, ability to negotiate. 
I, I think that's probably a reasonable compromise because it still wipes the deck of all the other uh, subsidies that are set up, which uh, we could talk about this a little bit more. One of the reasons they're so problematic is that as long as you have that place, that system in place, you are one petition for declaratory ruling at the FCC away from bringing in online video providers into that system. I'm not saying that that would work, but it certainly could. And you could easily wind up with a situation where online video becomes subject to this morass of complicated laws that had to do with how this marketplace developed 30, 40, 50 years ago. Right, which doesn't make any sense to apply. And it could be very costly. Right. Sure. I mean, you know, not to, not to go too much into depth, um, I certainly agree it would make no sense to, for example, to call Netflix or Hulu a multi-channel mm-hmm. video programming distributor and subject them to traditional regulation. We do generally support the notion, at least that the law as written today, is technologically neutral so that if you did choose to structure your system exactly as a cable system, uh, which some services like Sky Angel have uh, chosen to do, then there's no reason that uh, at least you couldn't benefit from some uh, of the of the current system. But uh, that is, you know, that's another matter. But ultimately, I think uh, there is not as much disagreement about what the future of video should be uh, between groups like public knowledge and groups like uh, tech freedom. I think we both agree on the ultimate goal. We might disagree about what steps are, are needed to get there. So, um, you know, we're looking forward to having you know, this discussion over the next few months. Well, I I appreciate that, John. I I just want to make one point here uh, clear, which is that this isn't just about that subsidy system. It's about the potential for uh, a range of other FCC uh, obligations uh, to be imposed on these online video providers. So in other words, without getting into a lot of detail, uh, what we're really talking about here is the threat that the online video marketplace, that, that key part of the internet, could potentially become subject to regulation um, through the traditional sort of regulatory model, uh, which is not a good thing for anybody. And there are certainly people in the media access movement uh, who have tried to use that regulation for many decades uh, to ensure uh, that government levels the playing field. For them, uh, and I think perhaps this is different than for John, but for them, they basically think that the First Amendment is not a shield against government meddling, but rather a sword for government to um, to ensure that the marketplace is fair and that people have access rights. And, and you've seen that in other areas of Internet services. And I just would briefly mention that uh, we can get into antitrust in a minute here. But when XM and Sirius uh, were merging, so they were two, you know, Internet ish, if, if, if you will, uh, providers of content. The SEC actually, in, in, in finally approving their merger, um, extracted from them supposedly voluntary conditions about who was going to get channels on their systems. In other words, they basically got into the business of, of dictating uh, program access. And that's just that's one very small example of how this could go. But uh, that's not a world that I want to live in. I, I would prefer to keep the government's hands out of these, uh, out of these matters. All right, so it's called the Next Generation Television Marketplace Act. We'll continue to keep an eye on that and see where it goes. Sounds like it stands a chance of really shaking things up. Uh, Judge Alsup in the Oracle versus Google case definitely shook up Oracle's world and handed Google a huge victory this week by holding that the APIs that Oracle was arguing were subject to copyright were not actually copyrightable. Uh, Issued an incredibly lengthy and detailed and well-researched 41-page decision on the point, um, clearly trying to uh, buttress and lay out the logic for the Court of Appeal, which will inevitably take a look at all of this. Uh, But when it comes right down to it, the judge decided that these were functional pieces of code and not creative works, distinguishing them from software and uh, finding that there could be no infringement of something that's not subject to copyright, to put it terribly, terribly simply. Uh, John, you've been paying attention to this issue of API copyrightability. What do you think? I think it's a great decision. <laughs> I think the I think the decision is a masterpiece. Uh, it's also very educational because he really walks through the history of the issue. 
Mm -hmm. um, and I think it's a great day for software developers if Oracle's uh, theory would prevail. And of course, they're still subject to appeal. Um, you know, that puts the basic concept of making compatible products and interoperable products at risk. Because all, what Google did was they made drop-in replacements for some for some uh, Oracle-owned code. They didn't copy any of their actual code. They just made their own code that worked the same way for the purpose of maintaining functionality for Java developers. And if that itself uh, was held to be a copyright infringement, uh, any number of services uh, and, and products that we have today would be illegal. In fact, um, MS-DOS in the early 80s was first developed as something called QDOS by a developer who made it to be an API compatible clone of uh, something called of an older operating system called CPM. So essentially DOS, which eventually morphed into Windows, was you know the Android of its day. It was designed to be a backwards compatible clone of a pre-existing uh, product. And that has never been considered to be a uh, copyright infringement. There are. It is true that there are ways to infringe the copyright of software that go beyond simply copying lines of code. But uh, the judge rightly found that, uh, at least with this API issue, uh, those rare conditions uh, were not met. So I think it's a great decision. Yeah, and I think we were. Um, I think everybody was really lucky that Judge Alsop was on this case because, as John said, if um, everybody should read this if they want to really understand uh, how Java works. And I mean, I think he made a great analogy when he compared APIs to a library with each package being a bookshelf and each class being a book and then each method being a chapter in that how-to book. And I think it could have gone a different way if there wasn't somebody who understood um, the technology so well. Actually, Judge Alsop is a coder himself. So, and I, and it's probably likely that Oracle is going to appeal this decision. Um, but again, Judge Al Alsop's decision is going to go a long way in educating the appeals court, who may not be as up to date on technological issues as him, as to how this works and how important it is. Well, hopefully yeah, they'll that. get Judge Kaczynski on the panel and that will help matters as far as being technologically up to speed. Um, I think one of the uh, soft points that Oracle might poke at on appeal is the fact that Judge Alsop didn't make this specific to the Oracle versus Google case. It seems like the pronouncements that he made have broader application than that. Um, although I suppose one could argue about that. Uh, we got an email from a programmer who I think sort of gets right to the heart of the issue of the copyrightability of APIs. As a programmer, um, he feels that, you know, he's not a lawyer and he's not terribly up to speed on copyright laws. But uh, you'll see us, he says, debate and argue sometimes for days about the name of a single function, but the code inside it never gets any discussion. Someone slaps it together in 45 seconds, maybe three weeks later, a colleague will delete the whole thing and create it again without even bothering to mention the original author. Um, so his question is that the only valuable part of a programmer's work is actually the API. He thinks it's the only piece of his craft that has any value whatsoever. 99% of programming is API design, he says. So, Trevor, I, what do you think? Oh, did John want to step in there? He can go yeah, ahead. Yeah, John, I'm go sure. ahead. Well, I just think that people shouldn't think that the fact that something is not copyrightable means that it's not creative or means that it's worthless somehow. There are other mm -hmm. ways to protect the, uh, you know, the creativity that no doubt... Uh, stands behind a lot of programmers' choices. And uh, in the opinion, as as the judge rightly points out, um, you have patent protection for a lot of the things that Oracle was claiming copyright protection for. No one says that like a great mechanical invention is not creative and original and uh, maybe deserving of some sort of protection. That doesn't mean it should be copyrighted, though. Um, and there was a particular danger of there being double protection in this case, where something gets both copyright and patent protection, and that would be right. uh, quite dangerous. All right, Trevor, any thoughts on this? No, it's, 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 that was exactly what I was going to say. You know, the, mm -hmm. the judge specifically said, you know, I'm not um, ruling that this is not patentable, but mm -hmm. it's not copyrightable. And, right. you know, the, the, 
the and time they just length lost of a patent is much patent lower plate. than a cop, you know, copyright. And so this would essentially freeze all innovation and, you know, destroy the way that, you know, the internet works. And luckily the judge understood that. All right. Well, congratulations, Google and their legal team. And uh, we're sure that uh, they're glad to have this victory under their belt, but we're also sure it's not the last word on the subject. Um, The other thing that Google has been up to that I've been paying attention to is uh, some very creative positioning on antitrust issues involving Eugene Volokh, and uh, another law firm, what is the name of that firm? Uh, begins with an A. Oh, that's the Volick one. Uh, someone ride to my rescue if they can remember the other firm that they've involved. But basically, um, here it is. Marvin Amori and oh. Luke Pelican. Literally oh, a yeah. Pelican brief <laughs> on antitrust issues. Volick tackled the First Amendment and wrote uh, a lengthy brief on how the First Amendment would preempt uh, copyright law from applying, I'm sorry, not copyright, antitrust law from applying to Google in the various ways that uh, folks are asserting it should be applied. Um, And then the Amari brief uh, takes aim at uh, the various penalties and the fact that no public benefit would flow from them. Um, so Baron, I know that, uh, this is an issue near and dear to your heart. First of all, can you tell us, um, this seems kind of unprecedented to me that a big company would, uh, commission briefing in anticipation of an antitrust challenge. Has this happened before? Well, I, I couldn't speak to that. Um, mm-hmm. it's not unusual that companies commission work that, uh, tries to develop constitutional law here, and I think that's generally for the better. These these are hard issues, and they don't tend to get thought through um, well unless you have people think about them ahead of time. In other words, any, anyone who's been involved in doing amicus briefs knows how, uh, how ultimately frustrating it is that you really only have so much space to develop an argument in a brief, and, and um, if we wait until uh, litigation, uh, we don't generally tend to get the most thoughtful decisions for, for the sort of reason that was being alluded to earlier. So I don't think that's unusual. I, I also think it's worth noting here that um, this didn't just come out of nowhere. In fact, um, uh, the, this paper that uh, Eugene did is really building on earlier decisions, most notably the uh, Search King decision uh, several years ago, which I believe was a district court decision, I think in Texas, um, uh, holding that um, Google exercises editorial discretion and thus that its uh, its search results are um, pro- constitutionally protected. We, we get into this in some degree uh, in the chapter in the, the free ebook that Tech Freedom published last year called The Next Digital Decade, Essays on the Future of the Internet. I encourage everyone to check that out. It's at uh, nextdigitaldecade.com. It's also available in all the ebook stores. It's not an advocacy book on our part. Rather, it's 10 big debates about Internet policy, and one of them is about search bias. And you'll see there are both sides of that issue argued there. But one of the issues that's, uh, that's raised is, that, is this First Amendment concern. And while there are many uh, ways, there are many degrees of antitrust concern about Google, um, I, I think Eugene's point here in a nutshell is that um, – to the extent that, that the complaints are about Google's decisions about how to rank and prioritize content, uh, that at the end of the day, antitrust is a creature of statutory law. Congress passed a statute. Uh, it limits certain sorts of business practices. But none of that is Trump, excuse me, none of that trumps the First Amendment. By definition, those are constitutional values, and Congress can't supersede those uh, through a statute. So uh, if you're going to raise a concern about, uh, about Google, I, I, and I think the, indeed the best concerns that are raised there are not really concerns about uh, what Google does in its editorial judgments about presenting content to users, but rather about the other side of the market. We always say that Google's in a two-sided market and it's ultimately um, on the one side it's users, uh, and on the other side it's advertisers. And, and just to get back to the conversation we were having at the beginning of this conversation, there is indeed a third side, at least when it comes to um, to display uh, uh, ads, which is uh, advertisers um, 
uh, uh, the, excuse me, the publishers who show ads on their websites. Uh, my point here is to say that uh, these First Amendment arguments are not to defang antitrust uh, completely, but to say that um, if you're going to focus on a problem, on a clear harm, which is what antitrust is supposed to do, uh, the presentation of information to users is constitutionally protected speech. Uh, that doesn't stop you from alleging that, um, that Google uh, may, um, in some other respects, uh, when it is dealing with advertisers, that it may not be violating antitrust laws. And just to give you an example there, uh, the European Commission just came out uh, last week with four complaints about uh, Google's business practices. Uh, I think several of them are, are um, a little silly, uh, hard to fathom. Uh, for example, this concern, not, not, not the traditional search neutrality concern that Frank Pasquale and others typically make, which is the order that uh, links appear, but rather the integration of, um, of rich content like maps and saying that um, somehow Google is discriminating against its competitors by not including Bing maps in Google search results or giving users the option to, um, to basically tailor what appears on the Google page, which is sort of like saying that you should be able to get a, a newspaper with other people's content uh, in there. But there are some other concerns that the European Commission raised that are less silly, and one of them is about the conversation we were just having a moment ago is about an API, which is to say that uh, right now um, Google's best defense, I think, is that it has it has lowered switching costs for advertisers by allowing them to take their data out of Google AdWords and send it to another platform. Uh, but it is and that Google, uh, in the terms of service for its API for AdWords, that they bar you. Uh, so you as an advertiser, you can take your data out. You can use the API to build a robust tool to allow you, for instance, to synchronize your campaign on multiple platforms. But the terms of service prohibit a third party from building a, a platform for uh, advertisers to do that. So right now, you couldn't build uh, advertisingdashboard.com that would allow advertisers to manage their campaign across uh, Google's AdWords, Microsoft's Ad Center, uh, for example. And uh, there are good arguments for and against that. Um, it's certainly harder for Google to innovate and to, um, to uh, change the user interface if indeed a lot of its users are actually relying not on Google's interface for advertisers but, but on a third-party platform. But at least that's a that's a valid area for debate and one that, again, is not in any way precluded by this argument, which is ultimately about the presentation of, um, of information to users, which is constitutionally protected. And I could talk about more if you really want to. Uh, yes, perhaps in a minute. But first, I'd like to ask Trevor about this particular point uh, that Eugene Volokh makes that Google, in, in, he's attempting to distinguish... Uh, a must-carry case, Turner Broadcasting versus the FTC from 1994, um, that Google's more like a newspaper than a television company uh, because of the fact that it has original content in the way it decides to present results as opposed to simply carrying content provided by other people. What do you think of that, Trevor? Right, so there's a few things here. So Turner Broadcasting versus FCC basically said that cable companies must carry local stations in the local area if they want to operate. Uh, and this was for a few reasons. One, because they're just, as the court said, a conduit of information. They weren't producing their own information. And in another aspect, um, it would be hard, you know, the, the, the competition would be extremely limited in the cable situation, where if you only have one cable provider, it's either you watch that or you don't. Uh, in Google's case, both both situations are different. Uh, you know, we think of search engines as these kind of automated machines that just spit out information. Uh, but the algorithms, you know, are created by people and there's editorial discretion in how they're used. Uh, and as uh, Barron said, you know, there's already been two cases in the district court level, at least, that actually definitively rule that, uh, you know, search, the way search engines are set up and uh, and search results come out is actually editorial speech and protected by the First Amendment. Uh, and then there's also the question of, you know, the antitrust aspect and how people are getting their information. And in the in the cable in the cables case, you know, we have a situation where at least 
decision was decided that there was an option, other options for people. It was either all or nothing. Um, here, it, you know, people, when they have access to the Internet, they have access to Google, but they also have access to a whole host of other search engines, and they're not really forced to choose Google. Um, you know, we, we use the word Google as a way to describe search, and it's obviously the most popular search engine. But there's nothing stopping people from using uh, other search engines that may, you know, display content in a way in a way that they like more than Google's editorial choice. Yeah, okay. let, me, let me add to that just sure. to clarify one thing. The, the key aspect of the Turner decision was not merely that the availability of other alternatives, although that's certainly true. Uh, it was moreover that there was, uh, in that case, the court found a special characteristic of cable. Uh, which was uh, which which actually was a barrier to entry, which created that situation, and that was specifically the physical infrastructure that was built out for cable systems. So, just to get back to the point here, uh, it would be a mistake to to focus on uh, how good are the other alternatives to Google? Are they really uh, replicating the same experience? Uh, because what's more important is that at the end of the day, there is no special barrier to entry today. That uh, that prevents um, uh, other people from offering that that robust experience. Uh, this is what a lot of the antitrust debate has come down to. Microsoft has in the past claimed that um, that there is a scale problem and that they need to have a certain scale to operate. And while that might be true to some degree, uh, it certainly um, doesn't mean that they need uh, they need to have more than thirty percent of the market, which is essentially what they have today when you combine their share with um, with Yahoo's share, their search partner. Uh, whatever that threshold is, it's fairly low. And moreover, this is different from cable in the sense that it's not just a single paradigm. So we're not just talking about search and, and search and apples to apples comparison, but rather that there are that the market here is more diverse. There are lots of ways of finding information. And as an example of that, you, you see not only companies like Yelp that provide a particular uh, kind of vertical search, but also, you're starting to see that Facebook is emerging into uh, another vehicle for people finding information on the web. And that sort of paradigm shift, that's just a fundamentally different world from the uh, world that the court, uh, in which the court decided the Turner case, which was where one where it was really not uh, easily foreseeable that there would be that special characteristic uh, disappearing anytime soon. And we could debate whether that's actually happened, but I think, it's, I think Eugene is, is clearly right in this paper that... Um, uh, in summary, that, that search engine results and more generally the, the presentation of information online is protected speech and it's not subject to the kind of media access demands that I was alluding to uh, earlier. All right. John, do you have any thoughts on Google's antitrust positioning before we move on? No, I'm not really an antitrust expert, but I can say as a as a proud duck 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 go user, there are mm-hmm. there are alternative there are alternative search engines out there, and some of them are quite good. All righty then. Hey, uh, Trevor, I have a couple of uh, questions to toss your way in our, your capacity as our EFF representative for the day. Um, one is Colin was just telling me before the show that uh, EFF has dubbed iOS a crystal prison, um, aside from being quite eloquent. Uh, can you tell us briefly about that? Um, unfortunately, I didn't write that piece, but it's actually a All great right. piece if anybody's uh, interested. Um, it, ta- it just talks about um, essentially walled gardens and how, you know, uh, our, our iPod pod and our iPhone and our iPad are, are, are beautiful devices. And that's, you know, that's, that was Steve Jobs, Steve Jobs's, you know, motivation in creating them. Um, but that they actually restrict users from doing a lot of what they wish to do. And in the end, that's bad for both innovation and users. Okay, and secondly, this is reaching deep into the past, a case that, um, well, not that deep, 2007, a case that uh, EFF was involved in. Folks will remember um, the dancing baby dancing, or maybe it was a child, to Prince's Let's Go Crazy, which actually resulted in a lawsuit. And uh, I wanted to just bring up this issue of music used in YouTube videos and revisit it since there has been a lot that has happened since 2007. Just last week, uh, we had... 
the very viral uh, video flying around of the lip dub, dub proposal in case anybody missed it. I think we might have a bit of it queued up. Uh, you guys will remember. You've probably seen it a few times now. Uh, the Bruno Mars song playing a central role in this really quite adorable wedding proposal. Okay, now that we've uh, put ourselves into the questionable hobby, copyright hopper content ID system for YouTube, um, Trevor, hey, Colin, I think we're done with this thing. Uh, D- Trevor, what's the state of putting music in videos? And does it matter? You know, I would say that this one is very much a pivotal part of that video. Does it matter if you've just sort of captured some music that's playing in the background? Um, well, I mean, I think we can take this to the question of the Lens v. Universal case, um, mm-hmm. which actually is finally starting to ramp up again in October uh, the, both, there's cross summary judgment motions, which, which the judge will rule on. And if anybody's not familiar with this case, it goes all the way back about five years ago, where there's a 29 second clip of a print song playing in a YouTube video with a baby dancing to it. And, uh, Universal sent a takedown notice, um, to YouTube and, uh, the owner of the video ended up suing. Uh, we're involved in this case. Um, and way back in 2007, when, uh, the content company tried, or UMG tried to get this uh, dismissed. Uh, the judge ruled it was a great ruling in our favor, saying that they must take um, object or they must take the uh, the way or I'm sorry, they must consider fair use when issuing takedown notices um, mm-hmm. obje- objectively. And now we're actually getting to that. That was just the, on, in the motion to dismiss. And now coming up after years of procedural issues and, and other issues uh, regarding attorney-client privilege um, that have now been solved, uh, they're actually going to rule on that, the issue of whether um, they have to consider fair use when issuing takedowns. And it, it could be end up being a landmark decision as far as uh, these automated takedown uh situations that a lot of these content companies have going on. Like there was a situation six months ago where Warner Brothers admitted in court that they were sending automated takedowns to videos that they had never even watched or some that they, they, they didn't even own. And, you know, it go back, goes back to your point that you were just mentioning where they, they have these systems where they kind of capture uh, videos that could be completely fair use, but they just kind of match up with, with their song. And it's become a real problem where, you know, YouTube has to take down thousands of these videos all the time um, with what are legitimately bogus takedowns. Right. A couple of things to mention here. First, that, of course, it's not necessarily the artist that has anything to do with whether a takedown notice is issued. Uh, Bruno Mars here uh, tweeted that, he congratulated the uh, groom to be and the bride to be and said he didn't think he could have made a better music video for the song. Um, secondly, uh, it seems to me that Google has been trying hard in the background to make it so that things don't necessarily get pulled down, so that you know the content ID system. Uh, puts information in front of the rights holders and then they can make an informed decision about whether they're going to um, let it stay. And, you know, there have been proposals out there for ad revenue sharing. So it's a very um, case-by-case basis kind of decision that they can make and decide, well, do we really want the the bad PR of taking down this cute wedding proposal kind of video. Is Am I right that that's sort of where things stand? I remember that in well, January of this year, there was a, an opt-in period with independent labels uh, where they could do that. But I don't know where things stand with the majors exactly. Do you know, um, Trevor? Actually, I'm not exactly sure where um, their specific deals stand with mm-hmm. the major record labels and movie industry. But... I think the general point you're making that YouTube has to decide on a case by case basis, and it's great that they're they're taking the steps to realize, uh, you know, 
take into account that these may be bogus uh, takedown notices anyways. But that puts a lot of pressure on Google and it shouldn't, you know, the, the pressure should be on these companies not to issue them in the first place. You know, Google has to spend however many thousands of hours going through these on a case by case basis because they've been getting so many bogus takedowns. And, mm-hmm. you know, it should start with the content company to begin with. If they're sending out automated takedowns that they've never seen or are clearly fair use, then they should have to pay for that because it's the it's YouTube that ends up having to pay for it. And then it's the, the person who posted the video that ends up having to pay for it because their content gets taken down. Um, and so it ends up where you know the content company is in a no-lose situation if they're not able to be punished for sending all of these ridiculous takedowns. So, I mean, I, mean, I think the, the lens of a universal case um, can really would really shed some light on that um, if the judge rules in our favor, which is saying that you know they actually have to take this into account before they just send these out, you know, however they want. Right, and what what's the timing on that? Uh, I it's I believe motions are due this summer, and then argument is in October. All righty then. Uh, someone and- was going to chime in. Yeah, just last week, just as an illustration of the pitfalls that can happen, particularly with uh, automated content filtering like Mm -hmm. YouTube uses. Um, Some years ago, the Jay Leno show, maybe it was the Tonight Show at the time, uh, aired a clip from YouTube. And then as the Jay Leno show itself got added to Yahoo's content ID, the original clip that was aired on the Tonight Show... uh, was flagged as a violation of The Tonight Show's copyrights because the same sort of clip and the same music appeared in The Tonight Show as appeared on the YouTube clip. And the default setting is to assume that if there's something that's in a TV show and there's something that's on a YouTube clip, it must be the YouTube clip that copied it. But in actuality, uh, The Tonight Show had copied the YouTube clip. Um, That's just one of the perverse things that happen with uh, these automated takedown systems where there is no human review and they're sent down... uh, you know, sent out by robots, essentially. Right. So, John, I'm, yeah. I'm curious. What, where, where do you go with that concern? I mean, at, at the end of the day, here we're talking about a massive scale problem. Uh, those systems are designed the way they are um, to, to, as you say, uh, focus on, uh, if not entirely, use uh, uh, algorithmic machine-driven uh, review uh, because of the costs of having humans look at it. What do you think the right answer is? How would you improve yeah. that? It's hard to say, but you could have an algorithmic system that notifies the owner of a video that his video is about to be taken down and gives him an opportunity to challenge it before the takedown happens, uh, in some situations at least. Part of the problem yeah, right. is their, their, their content's being taken down for a couple of weeks automatically. So, you know, they're, if they're making money off of advertisements, whether or not it was fair use or completely mm-hmm. legitimate, um, they're going to end up losing money because they're getting all these takedown notices sent to them. Well, I, I'm glad a- that in the end we can finally agree that advertising can be a good thing here. There we go. We're right and, back to it. Yeah, <laughs> the entire this is a- advertising ecosystem. And by the way, I don't necessarily see this as a policy or, or a law question just as a an example of, uh, I think there's a lot of magical thinking where people think there's a magic stop piracy switch that you can just flip and you can just automatically detect uh, copyright infringements and not have any false positives. And examples like this just show how hard a problem that is. And that's the kind of factual backdrop that you need to have when when deciding what the right laws and policies uh, ought to be. The fact that these things happen uh, quite frequently. Right. And I think the takeaway for our viewers and listeners on the point of music and videos is that we don't have any certainty on this yet. And if you're making something, you know, like Isaac's live lip dub proposal, um, you you better think long and hard about using something like Bruno Mars, because even if the user or even if the artist approves and and, you know, it winds up giving great exposure and probably lots of sales to the songs you still might wind up having that thing taken down. So um, we need to find a better solution to that particular problem, I think, without any question. All right, I have uh, a few things to impart to you as we close up the show today. Uh, A tip of the week for you. Our tip is beware of employers bearing mansions as we uh, come up to the summer Um, We have been uh, 
seeing lots of hackathons happen. In fact, I'd love to say congratulations to the winners of the Hack the Act competition um, at the Brooklyn Law Incubator and Policy Clinic. Uh, It was the uh, DMCA for Trademarks uh, submission. The first prize went to really like this notion of trying to come up with legal solutions in a hackathon. But hackathons can cross the line, as serial entrepreneur Ryan Carson sort of grumpily pointed out. Um, that and then the uh, analogy I get is sort of to the MTV Beach House, where you throw people into a a nice sort of cushy environment, but you're completely taking advantage of them. So uh, Ryan writes, next time some t- someone asks you if you want to crash their hacker mansion for the summer, which has a bar. Uh, barbecue and pool table or team up for a 24-hour hackathon, think twice, they may just be trying to cash in on your youth and optimism. So um, uh, hackathon at your own risk, I guess, would be the uh, tip for the week and going into the summer. And then our resource of the week comes to me via Gord McLeod on Google+. Plus. It is an exhaustive look at the tax implications of the zombie apocalypse. And it's, it's somewhat ironic and, and awful in the wake of the uh, gruesome events that happened in Miami earlier this week, um, but perhaps provides an explanation for those because uh, we have here law professor Adam Shotero taking a stab at estate planning for the undead in perhaps the only legal paper to cite both the Internal Revenue Code and Weekend at Bernie's 2 <laughs> writes. Uh, I, let's see who's the author of this. Over at IO9, we come from the future. Um, we... Uh, we see that zombies um, have certain status that uh, may benefit them or hinder them from a tax standpoint, according to this paper, which is going to uh, be published shortly in um, a law review journal, no less. Uh, and that some people might specifically try to become a zombie or avoid trying to become one for estate planning purposes. So I certainly hope that's not what was going on and we're not seeing uh, the start of a trend uh, what with the actual zombie-esque attack that happened this week. But the the article itself is very lighthearted and fun and um, sort of uh, takes legal scholarship to uh, new highs or new lows depending on your perspective on that. Um, also would like to point people to, if you have not already checked it out, uh, our sister show here at Twit Triangulation, episode 55 was with Rob Reed, the fellow um, who has written a book that I can't wait to read called Year Zero that uh, is all about uh, aliens coming and owing us lots and lots of money for the um, file sharing that they are engaging in and uh, pilfering music and owing uh, large amounts of royalties to America, or, uh, earthbound music publishers. Um, and he's, uh, he's also the fellow who did the great copyright math bit at TED. And uh, I commend you to episode 55 of Triangulation because he was wonderful with Tom and Leo on that. Um, so with that, guys, it's been a really, really fun show. And I really appreciate all your insights and the deep discussion we've had today. Baron Soka from Tech Freedom. It's been great having you on. Uh, thanks. I just would refer your re- listeners to the Cato Unbound Symposium this month on internet activism and whether it works. I'm doing that with uh, Rebecca McKinnon and engaging in some of the concerns about internet activism uh, that uh, people like Evgeny Morozov have raised. So we try to provide a balanced perspective there. I encourage your your readers to visit. And if anyone has anything to contribute to that debate, they can actually blog about it and uh, get featured in there uh, by Cato Unbound. So please check that out. As I mentioned, we have a free ebook called uh, The Next Digital Decade which is 31 essays by uh, 26 leading academics and thought leaders about a wide range of internet policy issues. So check that out on nextdigitaldecade.com or in your ebook store for free. Thanks so much, Baron. And and folks can find Baron on Twitter. He's Baron Soka there. Uh, we've really enjoyed your comments and insights today. And Trevor Tim, it's been wonderful to have you back on the show. Well, thanks for having me back. Always a pleasure. 
I hope, hope you will uh, continue your great work at EFF. We had uh, some other things that I that you've written lately that I was hoping we could get to today, but we've gone really, really long. So we'll have to have you back on again soon to talk more about uh, privacy-related things, drones, and other things you've been writing about at EFF. Anything else you want to plug or let people know that you're involved in? Um, I mean, just real quick on drones, we're actually starting a campaign next week where we're trying to uh, get people to call their local police stations and find out how they're actually, if they're planning on using drones and how they're planning on using them for surveillance. Uh, there was a law that just got passed a couple months ago that mandated the FAA uh, start issuing drone authorizations for anybody who can prove that they can fly them safely. And Homeland Security is giving uh, you know local law enforcement millions of dollars um, so they can essentially buy these drones for free. And there's huge privacy implications with these drones, given that they can fly for hours or days at a time and you know uh, use high definition cameras that can see a milk carton from 60,000 feet. So what I mean what we're trying to do is make sure that these law enforcement agencies are using them uh in compliance with the 4th amendment and uh or it, or if we can get the towns to bound, uh ban surveillance drones outright that's what we're trying to do. And so look for that next week. Great. Thanks so much Trevor. Uh folks you can find Trevor over at Trevor Tim on the Twitter and, uh, of course, at EFF as well. Uh, John, great to have you join us from Public Knowledge. I uh, hope your water comes back on. Yeah, yeah. Our, uh, our Public Knowledge headquarters is temporarily shut down due to a water main break in D.C. But uh, I would encourage you, I would encourage your listeners, if anyone is interested in uh, letting their voice be heard on the issue about ad skipping and DISH, uh, we, have a, we have an action alert type letter going on at uh, publicknowledge.org. If you click on Act Now, you can uh, send a letter to TV network executives expressing your outrage that you're being accused of being a copyright infringer for skipping commercials. Great. That's I know that uh, we'll have a lot of folks interested in doing that. Uh, so go follow up John uh, also on Twitter. He's at Bergmeyer there with an A. Uh, and you can find me between the shows. We've got a Facebook page where you can go and post up comments. And uh, I'm starting a new thing this week where um, there are a wealth. In fact, there are over 33 million Creative Commons images on Flickr with the attribution license. And I've never been able to find a good uh, banner or um whatever we call that, the larger picture on a Facebook page these days after the recent design change. Um, and I've decided, decided to start using uh, one of those and rotating them each week. So go check out our Facebook page to uh, appreciate some fine Flickr work that has been licensed for our and anybody else's use with attribution. And uh, we're also over on Google+. Plus. You can find us there. Uh, I'm on Twitter, D Howell, or you can email me. I'm Denise at twit.tv. We love hearing from you between the shows. You guys always send us wonderful ideas and stuff. So please keep them coming. And uh, with that, we'll go ahead and wrap up episode 164 of This Week in Law. We've really appreciated your joining us today and we'll see you next week. Take care. <laughs>